Thank you. I want to share with you an idea. What if the way we manage is unnatural? What if the way we've been led and the way we've been governed is actually an unnatural process for humans? I know the people that created it may have thought that it worked really well, but I just wanted you to think about that. Now today I want to talk to you about collaboration. I want to talk to you about some of the reasons around why we find it difficult, and I also want to show you what it looks like. You see, animals naturally collaborate, and after having spent years with sheep and cattle and, and dogs and horses, I wanted to share with you some of those lessons. So what does it mean to collaborate? Well, I believe to collaborate is to put your own agendas aside and share your values and work with other people or an organisation or a company on a, on a collective vision or the greater good. Now, I want to show you uh, some footage. It's a little bit graphic, but uh, essentially it shows you what happens when animals don't collaborate and they step outside the mob. In the animal world, if you don't collaborate and you don't stick with the mob, you end up as meat. And I want you to kind of, I try and keep that in your mind for the rest of my presentation. You see, children naturally collaborate. Between the ages of three and four and five and seven, children naturally collaborate. They'll want to put their own agenda aside and work with other people and work with other children on a, on a joint project where there's a, a collective reward. You see, children are raw, they're untouched. They've not been conditioned, and any conditioning that there has been, you know, the depth and the complexities of those impressions around, you know, negativity or, or judging or, or, you know, political correctness are minimal. What I want to share with you is, is how innocent children can be and how animals are also innocent. They all just go along doing their thing, kind of oblivious to the outside world. So humans can be very much like, like animals. Now, I know what you're going to say, you know, we're nothing like animals, you know, but I've got some kind of fun examples I wanted to share with you. Imagine you're at a pub, it's a little bit late, it's after dinner, and, and, a, and a, this is mainly for the guys. Or just, I want you to observe, a woman walks in and she looks absolutely amazing, beautiful body, perfectly dressed, hot red lipstick, she's really sexy, and she walks straight to the bar. Now, I want you to look at all the guys. I bet you they all look. A few of them will puff their chest out, some of them might kind of, you know, reposition themselves, and then the groups of guys will kind of, you know, hey, you gonna, you gonna have a crack at that? You know, they get all, you know, they get all stirred up. Now, when you put a cow into a mob of bulls, you get the exact same result. <laughs> you put some ewes past a paddock of rams, and the rams carry on, it's hilarious. But then, of course, we can be quite different, and that looks like this. <laughs> I mean, you would never, ever, walk up to your girlfriend or your wife and do that to in front of her friends. <laughs> it's absolutely disgusting. And I should like to think, I should like to think that after, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years of evolution, at least maybe we're the more courteous of the species. As I mentioned, children naturally collaborate. And that there is a difference between collaboration and cooperation. You see, cooperate is an action, it's something that we do when we work together. Whereas collaboration, it's a, it's a belief, it's a mindset, and it's the process. As I said, it's the act of putting that, that, that agenda or those, those priorities aside and working on that greater good. So if we naturally collaborate when we're children, why does that tend to dry up as we get older? Well, I want to introduce John, John Citizen. This is him when he's a, a few months old through to the time that he's in his 80s. And I'm just going to put a snippet of, uh, of, of labels and belief and bias that, that we have that come into our lives that, that we use to separate ourselves from other people. So religion is going to be something that, that comes up. Of course, he's political persuasion. Of course, he's white or is he ethnic. But what does that mean to him? Does he identify with that? Does he think that he's different to someone who's black? He's, is he the elite minority, the common majority? Again, he's male, but what does that mean to him? Does he think he's better or, or inferior to females? What class does he belong to? 
Is he an introvert? Is he an extrovert? Of course, occupation, we always separate ourselves by occupation. Actually, I've got a mate who's a, who's a pilot, and um, he says to me, uh, how do you know when a pilot's at a party? Because he'll tell you. <laughs> I reckon that's a beauty. So. Um, you know, of course, we're all consumers, but is he an Apple man or is he an Android man? Does he drive a Holden? Does he drive a Ford? Or is he, you know, he's, he drives a Mercedes? You see, from the time that little John here is this age to the time that he's in the workforce, he's carrying a whole lot of baggage. There's a heap of beliefs and, and bias and labels that he honestly believes in. Because right here, all he is is white or ethnic or, or whatever, and, and a male, and then all this other stuff. And as I said, it's just a snippet that he gets loaded onto him. And the harder that he clings to those beliefs, the, the, the greater the inability it is for him to work with other people that share different beliefs or that think about things differently. So my emphasis here is that we need to be open-minded. You see, animals fight for, for food and territory. Humans fight for beliefs. And we, we see that on the news every night. Why do they fight for beliefs? Well, beliefs guide behaviour. And behaviour is the pathway to acceptance in a culture. A mob's identity is shown or shaped by its behaviour, by its actions, like praying. Or, or by its symbols or brands, like a Harley Davidson crest, or um, you know, the Star of David, by our jewellery, by the clothing we wear. I mean, I'm in Australian agriculture, I'm wearing brown R. M. Williams boots, jeans and a shirt. It's, it's, you know, it's very, very well known in, in, in the culture. You see, sheep and, and cattle can coexist quite, quite happily, even though they share different beliefs, of course. You know, they both eat grass, you know, they both, uh, dr both drink water, they're both prey animals. Um, you know, but when the pressure comes on and I stick a dog or, or I come in there, I put a dog behind the mob and I, I bring them all in. The cows will get up and usually join with the cattle and the sheep will all become their own flock. Their, their minds are incapable of interspecies collaboration. That's because that's what they've done to survive. We're not. We're all one and the same. And, and all we have is those beliefs and we have the luxury of, of using parts of the brain that we've already heard about tonight, of, of changing the way we think about things. So what happens when an animal rejects a mob? What happens when a little child, for whatever reason, rejects a family? What happens when an employee rejects a job or an organisation? Or more importantly, what happens when their behaviour doesn't resemble the culture that that organisation's a part of? Well, we saw what happens earlier. You see, if you're, if you're outside the mob, you've either been rejected or you're rejecting the mob, or you're trying to lead. And I'd say fairly unsuccessfully. The mob's not with you. You don't have any followers. And we see this happen in politics and, uh, and business all the time. We see it happen all the time. It's a very old school, traditional way of, of, of managing. It's very top down. But in 2015, we have these amazing collaborative platforms popping up all around the world. It's changing the way we, we, we do things, the way we connect. And they're just not about top to bottom, they're about bottom to top and side to side. I want you to think of, of Google. There's an organisation that's incredibly transparent. They, they, they encourage open innovation amongst their employees. And, and they, um, you know, as I said, they, they, they move side to side, top to bottom. They're, they're very, very transparent. Everyone understands the goals and they all work on those same goals. Think of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Um, another collaborative platform, Airbnb. I mean, they're, they're really starting to knock around the hotel industry. They're the biggest hotel company, I think, in the world. They don't own a single bed. Same with uh, Uber and taxis. We've got these collaborative leadership platforms that are popping up and people are rushing in. They feel really natural. They feel really great. And they're really changing the way we do things. So you're probably saying, I get, okay, right, I understand, Sam. Yeah, right, next point. What does it actually look like? What is that movement, and you know, as I said, top to bottom, side to side, what does it look like and how do we actually manage in that? Well, I want, to, I want, to, you know, I want you to check this out. Did you notice how they all stuck together? They all moved as one. 
And I want to walk you through that in real time and explain to you what they're doing. But I firstly, want to, I want you to understand that a mob of sheep or cattle are made up of three parts. Leaders, the middle, and the tail end. So what, what happens is, so you can see that in the middle there, the leaders are going to make a bit of a break for it, and they're forging ahead, and they're going to come around the right-hand side of the mob. The middle are starting to follow, and the tail end on the right, you can see essentially just standing there waiting for the mob to move, waiting for things to happen. Now the leaders, are, which are led by one sheep in particular, but there's about 20 or 30 of them are coming down there, and they're going to come along the left-hand side of the screen. And as they do that, all the leaders will forge to the front of the mob, or the middle will start to pick up, and you're just going to start to see the tail end start to mobilise, and they're all going to move right there. So why does that work? Well, there's no conviction to individualistic beliefs. They've all put their own agenda aside, which is to eat or go to the toilet. And in some cases, I've even seen give birth. They've put that aside and they've joined up with the mob because that's what they do to survive. And, and they, they do that for everyone's benefit. So uh, all organisations or companies, do they all look like this? Well, I would say no, and I'm going to be pretty bold, but to me, that represents a, probably a government organisation. <laughs> not, not a lot of leadership. You know, not, hardly any innovation. You see, the thing is, there's a huge amount of, you know, red tape, bureaucracy, systems, protocol, procedures. Innovators can't hack that. They can't deal with it. Uh, you know, their, their culture and the way they behave, they need to be in an organisation where that's encouraged. As I said, so not, not a whole lot of leaders. There will be, of course, there's, there's leaders in there. Not a lot of innovators. A very productive nine or five, you know, rock up, get it done, productive group here. And then a tail end, which, are, you know, you'll have loafers there and, you know, job for life, kind of just chill out. What's this organisation? Well, to me, I'll, I'll, I'd probably think of Apple. Huge amount of innovation, changing the way the human race connects and, and, and talks. Look what they did to Nokia. You know, and then, and then a very productive, you know, your nine or fivers that are smashing out all that detail and making and, and implementing everything that's happening up here. But of course, they've gotten rid of their tail end. It holds them up and it makes them uncompetitive. Why else does this work? Well, you'll notice that the, the tail end isn't regressing. You know, they're not separated out the back there by their, you know, bad attitudes and tall poppy syndrome, which we've heard about earlier tonight, or, or their chips on their shoulders. They're still in the mob. The leaders aren't aggressing. They're not out the front, separated in a class of their own, you know, with their, with their egos or their agendas again. You know, the, we, sheep aren't hamstrung by this wave of narcissism that we have coming through our own culture, where people think that they're, they're really different or that they've been told that they're super special and that some way they think that they're better than other people. It absolutely obliterates collaboration and, and the capacity to work with other people. <coughs> you see, the thing is, I really believe we're trying to shake up to you know, 2,000 years of, of very structured and unnatural behaviour around management and leadership. I mean, Alexander the Great said, I'm not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep, I'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. And we all kind of understand what that means. But essentially what he's, what he's singling out is that the leader has to be singular and separate. And, and the lion's instincts and values are very different to the rest of his mob. He's pushing an agenda that's, uh, that's, based on, um, you know, that's based on the leader being an aggressor or a hunter or a dominator. And we see this all the time in, with you know, old archaic insignia like flags and emblems. It's always eagles and lions and tigers. He said they honestly believed that to create movement and to create power, that everyone had to believe in someone rather than themselves. Now, fast forward to 2,000 years to now, and we've got these collaborative global platforms popping up all the time. And they're not just in, in, in apps like Airbnb, but they're in businesses around the world. And they're changing the way we do things. The people that are a part of those mobs, uh, are, 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 everyone's winners, they're all engaged and they're all moving with the mob, as we saw with the sheep. We have this absolute kind of commitment in our culture to be, all be leaders. We all want to get to the top, yet many of us aren't up to the responsibility of what it takes to be a leader. They're more kind of fixated on the power that it will bring them or, or the materialisation of their eventual achievements rather than the, the collective good and the greater good that they can bring to anyone and everyone on their journey. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. You see, the thing is, sheep lead from within. 
The leaders will step out from time to time when they have to, but essentially they move with the mob and encourage everyone to move forward. There's, there's no conflict of, of ego or pride if you're stuck up the back here in the tail, tail or the middle. It doesn't actually matter. What matters is that you have that trust and that you're secure in yourself. You have no insecurities and you can put your own agenda aside and work with everyone else on that collective good or that, that, you know, that greater vision. So what does that mean and how does it affect us? Well, I'd, I'd, just, I'd leave you with, you don't have to like it, but be open to it. You don't have to instigate it, but be open to the fact that others may want to. Because if you're in the mob, they'll essentially have you in mind. And if you can do that, I think you'll understand what it is to be a part of a, a very natural movement, one that's based on, on evolution, and therefore what it's like to be led by sheep. Thank you.